because he extended his arms on the cross and the perfume filled the whole air. I don't know what in the world he's talking about there. I never read anything in the Bible about perfume at the crucifixion of Christ. Another Saturday, another Pope video. Today, I want to talk about Pope Theophilus. Pope Theophilus um, was an interesting Pope. He reigned from 384 to 412. 384 to 412. So this is early church uh, history, early church period, okay? Tail end of the, of the fourth century is when he started to have his position of, of power and influence, okay? So... Pope Theophilus, um, what he did to really, I guess, be influential and be important was first he went into a, a, a well-known pagan temple, him and some other guys, some cronies. They went in there and they took some of their idols and some of their artifacts and things that the pagan people had in their temple and he brought all that stuff out in the street um, in order to mock them. So he brings their idols out and he starts mocking their idols in the street in front of everybody. Now what that does is it makes the pagans very upset. So then the pagans physically mount an attack against the Christians, to which the Christians counterattack. So there was a counterattack from the Christians against the pagans. And this is one of the most important things in church history because what happened was when the Christians counterattacked, they destroyed the serapum, okay? Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that exactly right. It's S E R A P E U M, Serapium. But that was, they, they say that was like the daughter of the Library of Alexandria, meaning it was smaller in size, but still very influential. Okay, there was a lot of books and writings, and, and it was a, a, a significant temple to the pagan um, peoples there. Now, there had been a rift and a struggle among Christians and uh, pagans at that time. For, for years and years and centuries even. In the early church, there was that back and forth struggle and even persecution of Christians, but the Christians grew in number. And that's where the Nicolaitan people came in and they started incorporating paganism in with Christianity in order to gain more pagans over their side. And what happened was when this event took place under Pope Theophilus, they, historians say that was the singular event that established that Christianity, quote, Christianity was now the dominant faith for the, the land, for the empire. That was going to be the dominant faith of the area now. This Roman Catholic imitation of Christianity is really what it was. Um, so it becomes the dominant faith, dominant practice in the area after this attack because they raised that place to the ground. Now you can still go visit the ruins today of that temple. You can still go visit the ruins, but they, they raise it to the ground and, and to push these pagans back after mocking them, stealing their property and mocking it. Um, like I said, there was the attack from the pagans, the counterattack from the Christians, and that established Christianity, Catholicism, at the top as far as power and influence among the different faiths of the people of the different religions. That put Christianity on, uh, on top. Now this, this account is read off from Socrates, Scholasticus. He wrote about it, and I'm going to read it off uh, the screen back here. I'm going to read what he had to say. He said, seizing this opportunity, Theophilus exerted himself to the utmost. Okay, He caused the Mithraeum to be cleaned out, cleaned them out. Then he destroyed the Serapim, and he had the folly of Priapus carried through the midst of the forum. The heathen temples were therefore raised to the ground and the images of their gods molten into pots and other convenient utensils. So they took their gods and turned them into a pot for cooking or, or using a bathroom in or whatever and other convenient utensils for the use of the Alexandrian church. There's a red flag word, Alexandria. This, so you're reading about this, you say, that doesn't seem like the way Christians conduct themselves. These are Alexandrian Christians. This is a different breed of, 
of uh, so-called Christians. This, these are the ones that, that reign in from Alexandria, okay? So that's something to keep in mind when it comes to textual uh, criticism. So uh, that is the event that put Christianity at the top, okay? After he got into power, he establishes himself politically. Then he turns on other so-called Christians, okay? And that's always what the Catholics do. As soon as they get in the position of political power, they turn on their so-called brethren, right? If you are a Bible believer, if you're a Christian, um, then you're not a Catholic, first of all. And second of all, the Catholics consider you separated brethren. That's what they said at Vatican Council too. You're the separated brethren, right? But as soon as they get into a position of power, they will turn on you and they will kill you in order to maintain their dominance. And that's exactly what happened back in, in the time of Pope Theophilus. He establishes himself, and then he turned against Origenism, the following of Origen. Now, I don't like Origen, but I'm not going to kill the guy. I don't like Calvin, but I'm not going around killing Calvinists because I don't like John Calvin. But this guy didn't like Origen, and so he turned. Now, something else is interesting is he used to, Pope Theophilus used to support Origen. Now he's killing the followers of Origen. He killed like 10,000 followers uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly, he killed 10,000 people because they followed after uh, the teachings of Origen, which were crazy and wild, but still, you don't kill people for, for something like that. You mark them as a heretic. At, at worst case scenario, you mark them as a heretic and so other people know, and then you move on about your business. Um, but at any rate, Pope Theophilus was killing these people, and that's interesting because that's another pattern we see in Catholicism. Okay, uh, during the time of World War II, Pope Pius XII backed and supported and endorsed the Nazis and uh, Adolf Hitler. But as time went on and Hitler started getting a little too big for his britches, the Pope started to secretly plot to kill Hitler, a guy he had formerly supported. Just like Pope Theophilus formerly supported uh, Origen, now he was killing the followers of Origen. Just like the Pope supported the Nazis and Adolf Hitler, now he was trying to plot on how to kill Hitler because Hitler wasn't doing everything the Pope wanted him to do after he had power and money, he, what did he need the Pope for? And so the Pope now wanted to get rid of Hitler. So it's, you see the two-facedness of the papacy. It, it goes way, 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 way back before our time, the time of World War II, all the way back to Pope Theophilus even. We see this two-facedness going on. And now just to give you an idea of the theological impact he had, he really supported and got um, uh, transubstantiation going on. We have one of his sermons that have survived, actually. It is uh, the homily of Theophilus, or um, oh, what's the other name? It's the homily of Theophilus, or it's, oh, the homily of the crucifixion and the good thief. That's what it is. The homily of the crucifixion and the good thief. And I want to just read a few statements. It'd probably take you about 20 minutes to read the whole thing. I don't want to bore you to death, but I'll just read a few statements that I find interesting uh, here on the screen. One statement, he says, the cross is the completion of the sacred mystery. No, it's not. You have the burial and the resurrection that take place after the cross. Death, burial, resurrection. But he eliminates two elements of the gospel here. He says, the cross is the completion of the sacred mystery. For when the bread and wine are sacrificed on the holy altar, they are no longer bread and wine as before, but a divine body and a sacred blood. So there you've got transubstantiation now in the dominant faith of the land that he established by force, by killing. He makes it the dominant force, uh, faith of the land, and there you have transubstantiation taken up root. So that's one of the big impacts. And so now you have this idea, see, because he, he fought and killed people to establish his faith as dominant, that's an integral part of his faith. And all from there, all the way through the Middle Ages, through the Reformation, you have people being killed because they reject the idea of transubstantiation. They reject that and they're being killed for it. And that was accepted as regular practice, that type of violence, back in the time of Pope Theophilus. All right. Now, something else he, he says that's kind of odd. Let me scroll down to it here. In his sermon, he, he says this, and it's just it's just a bizarre thing to give you an idea of, of this, this type of preaching he did. It says, Come, peoples of all the earth, rejoice. Celebrate today because the Lord reigns from the wood. So this guy's killing idols. He says the Lord reigns from the wood. Now, I don't know if he had some wood there that, as a visual or what when he's preaching this, but I do know for centuries, Catholics, laymen in the Catholic Church, were made to bow down and pray and worship splinters that the Catholic Church claimed were from the cross of Jesus, which is obviously a lie. It wasn't really, but they, they claimed that. 
So I don't know if the veneration of relics is kind of getting started here uh, with Pope Theophilus, but he says, celebrate because the Lord reigns from the wood. And he says, all you that move in the waters raise your spirit because the blood was shed mingled with water. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then he says this, all you birds of the sky flap your wings with joy because he extended his arms on the cross and the perfume filled the whole air. I don't know what in the world he's talking about there. I never read anything in the Bible about perfume at the crucifixion of Christ. I have no idea. So this guy's just incorporating wild things in and uh, teaching stuff that's obviously not true, teaching lies. But when you've got, when you have that violent past, you can say whatever you want, make people do and tell people to believe whatever you want because they're going to be afraid uh, of the potential bloodshed if they oppose you. So this is where we start seeing a lot of um, mystic, weird, superstitious stuff getting into Roman Catholicism through this Pope Theophilus. So he's interesting because he's kind of bizarre and he's violent, and so that makes him interesting. But of course, he's a very evil, wicked person um, that played his part in history, or in the history, I should say, of the Roman Catholic papacy.